So what we're going to do now is we're going to start talking about Android services. So if you recall, we talked about activities before, and those are largely user-facing components, although as we saw with the, the download image activity from assignment number three, they don't have to be user-facing. They can also sort of run, quote, in the background. But the most common way to do it is to have them be user-facing activities, uh, user-facing operations. So that then begs the question, what is a service? Well, a service is basically a component in Android that allows operations to run, quote, in the background and perform long-running operations and or access remote resources. So things that need to run, that may take a long time to run, typically you would, you would have them run as services. And you'll see there's a variety of reasons for doing that. And we're going to talk a lot about services later uh, as soon as we get through this overview. So let's start talking about an overview of services. Unlike activities, services do not interact with users directly. Activities don't have to interact with users, but they typically do. But services cannot interact with users directly. And you can find out more about what services are in Android by reading this link. Typically, user-level services, we'll see later that there's two different kinds of services in Android. There's user-level services and there's system-level so services, or so-called system services. Um, Typically, activities start up services to perform some long-running operation or long-duration operation on their behalf. So one thing you might do, which you will do in the next assignment, is download an image, store the image, and then uh, collaborate with the activity to get the image that you downloaded and stored displayed. So that might be one thing that a service does. It doesn't actually display the images. It just sets things up so they can be displayed. And uh, if you take a look here, you'll find some interesting examples that are not identical to the ones that you're doing, but they'll give you a good template to look at that implements this kind of behavior. Other kinds of things that come prepackaged on Android that are service related, uh, email application uses services for various things, contacts, phone, music, all kinds of stuff uses services kind of to do stuff in the background. Typically, activities launch services. They don't have to be launched by activities, but I, I can rarely think of a case where they aren't launched by activities, but they're, it's possible to launch them from other services too. But typically an application launches a service. And the service, this is one reason why services are cool. Services can continue to run in the background even if the user switches to another activity. And you'll see when, when I run my little example program later, the one that does the, uh, the music playing application, you'll see that if we go and check email or we browse the web, the music will still continue to play in the background even though we don't have an activity that's currently focused on it. Uh, there was a good question today on the discussion forum about async task and some of the tricky aspects of async task and uh, what's, the prop, what's the connection between an async task and an activity that may reconfigure itself or be shut down and so on and so forth. And uh, services help to alleviate a lot of the tricky issues of using async tasks correctly in that context. We'll talk some more about async tasks later and I'll give you a deeper understanding of how to work around some of its design quirks. So the service will keep running even if the activity changes. The service should not access the user interface directly. Only the activity should be interacting with the user because the service is meant to be running in the background. And in order to do this, you use some kind of inter-process communication mechanism to pass information from the service back to the activity that you want to be displayed or processed in some additional manner or means. Uh, so for example, in assignment number four, the service will be doing the downloading of the image file and then it will go ahead and pass back to the client activity, the download activity, the path to the, to the file it downloaded on behalf of the activity. And then the activity, of course, is going to pick it up and display it. In addition to all these user level services, there's a bunch of system services and these basically expose low-level functions of the hardware and of the operating system and, and modules configured into the operating system to higher-level applications. And there's a bunch of them that you come to know and love with Android, things like the window manager or the telephony service, the thing that does the phone, activity manager, which is what is doing all the routing of intents to the right components. We've talked about that. Uh, downloading applications and installing them, the package manager, location manager, power manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all examples of system services. And they are typically written in C and C++. And there's a, a way that they can communicate. There's a way that services that are written using C and C++ can communicate 
with activities or other services written in Java. And the trick is to use something called the binder framework. And you can find out more about it here. So let's talk about how you might implement a service. Yes, sir? Why are they written in C++? Uh, good question. Why do people typically write things in C++ or C versus, versus uh, Java? It looked like you said some Performance, right? So uh, the idea there is that C and C++ typically are faster, typically are maybe lighter weight. They don't carry along all the virtual machine mechanisms, and so on and so forth. In fact, if you look at the Android source code long enough, you'll see that a lot of the source code methods that Android provides are actually implemented as native calls written in C and C++. So when performance matters, we still often fall back to to the traditional languages that are <laughs> super optimized to take every nanosecond of overhead away if possible. So how do we implement a service? Well, there's a couple steps involved, and you can read about these steps at this link. The first thing that you do is you extend the service class. And you either do this directly or indirectly. Uh, if you do it directly, as we're showing here, you have a service that, that extends, uh, you, you write your service to extend service, which is a predefined class. There's also ways of being able to do things by extending intent service. So that's an indirect way of doing things. Of course, intent service is a service, and we'll talk more about intent service later in the class. Those of you who are doing the undergrad version of assignment four need to get familiar with intent service, because that's the main thing you'll need to do, is, is write an intent service. Quite easy to write the intent service. Then you go ahead and override selective lifecycle methods. So if you extend service, there's a bunch of methods you have to override. Some are optional. Others, like on bind, well, I take it back. You have to override it, but getting it to do anything useful is optional um, uh, or unbind. Others are essential, like on create and on start command. On start command is really the most important thing to be, be done here. Uh, and then, of course, in addition to defining those, those methods, you may, though not necessarily, but typically, go ahead and define other methods or other classes that are nested inside of the, the enclosing service which is not unlike activities, right? Activities have all these hook methods that get called back to do lifecycle operations, but then you also often have to go ahead and override them as well as define other things. And of course, as with activities, the additional methods and classes you define are often where the concurrency and communication portions of services lurk. And by the time you're done with assignment number four, you will not only have additional insight as far as how concurrency mechanisms work in Android, but you'll also have deeper insights about how communication takes place. And uh, Android's got some pretty cool communication mechanisms for passing messages and making method calls and so on and so forth. Then, again, like an activity, you have to add the service to the Android manifest file explaining what the service is if you want it exported out to some other component. It's perfectly plausible to have services that are private or isolated and are therefore not needed to be exported or, or described in the manifest file. That's perfectly OK. But uh, in our case, we're going to have it exported just because it's more interesting to talk about. Um, by the way, that was another common mistake people made in assignment number three. And in having our TA office hours or our TA meeting this morning, I found out why. Apparently, one of the TAs was telling people to do what you're not supposed to do. Uh, so it's easy to fix during the review. But basically, a lot of people were creating an intent that associated the specific class with the implementation of the intent. So you would basically say, you know, new intent, and you would give it the, the class for the download image activity. And you were connecting it like that. Why is that a, that's not a bad thing. Why is that an undesirable thing to do? What's the downside of, of tightly coupling the implementation of the activity with the intent that launches it? Yes, sir. Less flexibility down the road, exactly. To put it a little bit more abstractly, you lose the ability to do late binding of implementations of an activity from the request to use the activity. So right now, the way it's supposed to be implemented, you ought to be able to come along and slide in a different way to download the image. You ought to be able to slide in a different way to view the image and so on. Right? Those could be things that could be added. And by doing it that way and keeping it loosely coupled, as you come up with newer and better and more exciting implementations, you can transparently interpose them into your solution without 
requiring any changes to the application. It just requires maybe the user to disambiguate the choice via some kind of dialogue that is popped up to prompt them. If you hard code it, all bets are off, right? Now you've got to use that implementation. You're stuck with it. Sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes it's not. But for this assignment three and assignment four, we want to make it so there's an option to be more flexible. It's just a good thing to know how to do. And it turns out to be very easy. In fact, it's actually less code to make it implicit binding than explicit binding. There turn out to be a couple of different types of Android services. There, there are two types of Android services. The undergrads are going to get a chance to play around with the first type, which are the so-called started services. And the grad students are going to get to play around with the so-called second type, or the bound services. For some reason, the Android documentation calls these unbound services, but they also call them started services, and that's what we we'll refer to them by. So let's talk about the two approaches, and we'll compare and contrast them. Very important to understand the distinction if, for no other reason, it tends to show up on quizzes. So uh, by the way, I was having fun the other day reading through the rate my professor's ratings. And um, one of the things that, it's not for the faint of heart, believe me. Although, in general, they were pretty good. And one of the things, the, the frequent complaints were that the quizzes were too hard. So I'm trying to help you by giving you hints about things that might appear on quizzes. Um, the other thing that they complain about, which I've tried to fix, is, is uh, giving assignments before we cover the material. So that should be a bit more smoothed out from now. That also helps to have videos so people can watch the videos if they need to get caught up on some things. All right, so started service, surprise, surprise, is launched by calling start service, which is an API method. And uh, as with activities, when you launch a service, you can pack extra information into the intent that's used to launch the service. So if you recall with the assignment three, you put some information along with the intent. Now, in that particular case, it was pretty simple because you, you put the data to be the URL. Um, in this particular case, we're going to pack some additional information in the intent that's going to be sent over to the, uh, the client. In particular, we're going to basically put in uh, the messenger that's going to be used to reply back from the service to the client. That'll be stuck in as an extra. And we'll talk more about that later. Started services usually perform a single operation. They could perform more than one, but, but most commonly they perform a single operation. And they don't have to return a result to the client. Sometimes they do, and in your assignment four, you will. You'll, you'll be returning back the path name that was downloaded from the image that you, you retrieved. But that isn't necessary. And there are certain things that just get launched as services that run in the background, and they don't directly respond back to the client, at least not on that particular request. And usually, after the operation is run one time, the service will shut itself down. And uh, there are ways to shut a service down from the activities perspective. But most of the time, a started service is also responsible for stopping itself. And we'll talk about stopping here shortly. So those are some of the things that a started service does that we'll see in a second, compare and contrast it with a bound service. So you can also stop an act, uh, you can have an activity stop a service, but typically they stop themselves. A bound service, not surprisingly, is launched by calling bind service. And once again, you can pass in an intent, and you can put data as part of the intent, and so on and so forth. Although it's less common to have to put the data with the intent with the started service, because as we'll see in a second, you end up getting some information that you can use for further communication with the service because it's not intended to be a single operation, a one-shot operation. In fact, bound, service, bound services are most commonly used for extended, where extended means can go on for a while, extended two-way conversations between the activity or the client and the server or the service, which is doing the implementation. And this particular implementation that the grad students are doing for assignment number uh, four doesn't have a long interaction. It, it's pretty much the same as a started service. But in, in general, you can have a started a bound service that starts up, and then you can talk to it for some period of time, making method calls and, pa and or passing messages back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's meant more for an extended conversation that takes place between these entities. The, uh, the service, a bound service, is automatically destroyed when the last client, which is typically an activity, unbinds from it. So, Unlike a started service, which 
usually shuts itself down after processing one operation or when there's nothing more to do. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means in the context of intent service shortly. A bound service will stick around until the last client unbinds from it. So it basically is a reference counting model. And when the last thing unbinds, it goes ahead and shuts itself down. So that's what a bound service does. All right, since this class, among other things, is focusing on concurrency, just so you get more comfortable with the concept, we're going to talk a little bit about concurrent programming with services. This is directly related to assignment four, so I'll spend a little time on it. This will be an introduction. There's more details we'll cover later. And of course, the other videos that are linked into the assignment description go into more detail about what you need to know as well. So both started and bound services can run in either the same thread or process as the client or clients, or they can run in different threads or processes as the client or clients. And you, well, it depends who you are, the developer of said service and or the user of said service from a programming point of view, someone who wants to take a service and use an existing service with their ac application, you can decide what the mapping is with respect to processes and services. And we'll see that this ends up being very simple. You just flip a switch in the Android manifest file, and magically something starts running in a separate process, which turns out to be very important. And we'll see some situations where that turns out to be important in a second. So you can either do this based on programmer logic. In other words, you can write code that spawns threads. Or, uh, and, and here are some things you can use. You can use extent, uh, intent service, which basically has a background thread that processes the intents in a different thread than the main thread. You can start a Java thread, which you can do for assignment number four. You can use an executor service thread pool, which you don't need to do for assignment number four, but you could. Um, so there's various ways of doing threading programmatically. Or you can select these settings by things you tweak in the Android manifest file. And this is a good example of configuration-driven flexibility in programs, which is all the rage these days. More and more software is moving towards a configuration-oriented way of tweaking its non-functional properties or different elements of its behavior uh, rather than having to write the code yourself because it gives you more flexibility. So what you do is you go into the manifest file and you add a new uh, attribute that says Android colon process equal and then you give it whatever you want to call this process. And what that says is when this service is launched, in this case it's the download service, it'll run in a background process that's not the same as the process the activity runs in that launched it. And we'll talk in a second about why you would do that. And there's some nice discussions about this here. All right, so let's talk about situations when you might decide to run a service in a separate process. Some services are intended to be shared by many applications. Uh, for example, Android comes with a download manager, which is a service that runs in the background and downloads stuff for you. There's other things you could have as a service that was intended to run in the background. For your assignment number four, you'll write a service that's intended to run and conceivably uh, you could have multiple applications connect to it and use it to download stuff. So that's an example of a shared application. So whenever you write something that needs to be shared by other applications, you need it to run in a separate process because if it didn't run in a separate process, then it would be tightly bound with the activity process that spawned it. And if that activity went away, it would go away as well, ultimately. Um, because of the fact that you have the ability to run services in different address spaces than the clients that connect to them, you need some kind of inter-process communication mechanism to communicate with them. By the way, before we leave the topic of why would you ever want to have a service run in a separate process, can anybody think of another reason why you would want to have a service run in a separate process above and beyond the one I just gave, which was so you could share them by multiple applications? Tristan. Yes. Okay. So you might have a service that had special privileges. It was allowed to access certain things. But you didn't want every application on the phone to have that special privilege. And so as a result, you could write it as a service, and that would be a special kind of entity that could access things that other parts couldn't. Likewise, protection. Uh, if you write things in a separate process, what's one of the consequences of having one thing run in run process and one thing run in a different process? What's another? characteristic of that. We, we talked about this when we talked about Android and Linux and operating systems and so on. Does anybody remember what, what the main win is by doing that besides you? 
So what happens? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's actually not a bad answer. So the answer there is um, uh, you might want to have proprietary code that you don't want people to have access to, and you're nervous to put it in a jar file because people could reverse engineer it, right? <laughs> so yes, you, you could really very decouple these things. So that, that is a, that's a reason. That wasn't the reason I was thinking of, but that's another good reason. What's, what's the more common reason, though, for putting things in separate processes? Yes, sir. Exactly. So that, that's what Tristan meant when he said protection, but I just wanted to tease that out a bit more. So if I have a, an application in one address space, this is especially true, by the way, for C and C++ applications. A little bit less true for Java applications, although the point still applies. If we have all of our code in one address space, then if something goes wrong, like if one, this is true in C and C++, you, a program might go to some random memory address and just start scribbling over all the memory and just writing it to zero, right? And it could actually mess a lot of things up before something really got messed up enough for the process to crash, right? So there's certain things that you want to not allow that to happen. There could be reasons why you don't want people to have malicious code that screws stuff up. Yeah? Uh, yes, so uh, very good. So segmentation fault. If you program a lot with C and C++, eventually you'll either get a bus error or a segmentation fault. And that means usually you've dereferenced a pointer that points to some bad place, like zero or some protected part of memory that the operating system has access to alone and so on. And so if, if you have an application and all your code is in the same address space, and some function you call from a third party library accesses a null pointer and tries to write to it, that will cause the entire application to crash, which could be a very bad thing. If you separate things into different processes, even if one process incurs a fault, it won't affect the other processes necessarily. I mean, it depends what they're doing, of course, but the memory won't be corrupted. So that's one reason why we might choose to run things in other address spaces. Java makes it a little harder to do this, but you can still have things where you access variables and change them in ways that you don't want to have changed. So if you're going to separate stuff, now you have to come up with some way to talk back and forth between the different parts. And you'll see that there's a bunch of things you're going to get a handle on, uh, no pun intended, in assignment four. You get to play with intents which you've already done a little bit of. You'll play with them some more. And then messages, messengers and handlers, which are ways of being able to communicate messages across process address boundaries. They can come in handy other places too, but that's really where they shine. And then we'll see later the Android Interface Definition Language, or AIDL, which gives you a way to make method calls that are translated automatically by the Android AIDL compiler and the binder framework and so on into low-level remote procedure call operations that go across address spaces. So you'll see there's a bunch of different ways to exchange information between separate processes in Android. If you're really curious about all this stuff under the hood, the magic that does this is called the Android Binder. And it's really cool, and we'll, we'll cover it later. Not surprisingly, a lot of patterns involved here. Here are some of them. I won't go through them all right now, but we'll hopefully get a chance to cover some of these. If we don't have a chance to cover your favorite pattern that's listed up here, there are videos on the website, on the POSA 14 website on YouTube that go into great, great, great detail about all this stuff if we don't have time to cover them in class. All right, so let's talk about the application that uh, I'm going to demonstrate. And this will give you some hints as how to, to do assignment four, although, again, you're not doing a music player. So the music activity can play music via a started service. So to start this thing, and I'll run it for you in a second, you basically give it a link to a, a URL you want to have played. I have one by default that's kind of mindless, but there's some other ones you can play. And you click play, and that starts to play. And that'll keep playing while you're off doing something else. So you want to go off and download other images, do whatever you want to do. The music will still be playing. And then if you navigate back to this application, then you can go ahead and stop it, and that'll stop the music from playing. So just for kicks, let's, let's go ahead and see if we can play this thing. Oh, yeah, I have to exit the slideshow first. All right, let's see if this is going to work. So here's the application. So I'm not sure how well you'll be able to hear this thing, but let's give it a shot. 
All right, just sort of mindless, like, rave music, I guess. <laughs> and we can go ahead and stop it. And now let's give it something with a little bit more teeth to it. By the way, I'll, I'll probably get arrested by the um, Association for Music recording when I play this, but... Anybody know what that is? What is it? What's the song? What's the album? Who's the guitar player? Ben Halen. Ben Halen. What's the song? Eruption. Eruption. Very good. All right. <laughs> you probably can't hear it in the back. Anyway, so, oh, hold on a second. Let's see. Let's sh demonstrate. Oop. <laughs> so, basically, um, See if I can make this thing play. There we go. So you can see now it's playing in the background. I could start some other application. Do something else. It's still playing. All right. So your, your application will basically redo assignment three, except using services as opposed to activities but it's easy to extend. You can take a look at the code that goes along with this stuff. The way this particular example works is you create an intent, uh, and it can be created either on the, by the service or it could be created by the application, different philosophies there, by the activity. And it's going to contain data that indicates which song to play. In this case, it's going to be a URL. And then the music service will be started on demand. So when someone goes ahead and and clicks the button, that'll start the service. And this uses something called the activator pattern, which is basically used to launch things when they're needed. Why do we want to use on-demand activation? What's, th what's the motivation for starting stuff up on-demand as opposed to having it running already? When? Resources. resources, exactly. So if you're, if you're, not, if you're not, using, not using it, it doesn't take up any resources. If you start it, then it goes ahead and starts up on demand. What's the trade-off between launching things on demand, which by the way is called lazy activation, versus starting something up ahead of time, which is called <laughs> eager allocation or eager activation? Startup time, exactly. So startup latency. So if you do things on demand, then there takes a little bit more time for it to start up. If it's already running, then you get things to be faster, but then you have to have more resources. In the real world, people often use eager activation for things that they want to be very responsive. So, you know, if you work for an online financial services trading platform and you want to be able to get the latest values of the stock, you probably want that to be eagerly allocated. So when someone needs the value, it's right there. Conversely, if you're building a big, large-scale web hosting system, <coughs> like a cloud, you don't necessarily want to have to have everything being used all the time when no one's actually ac accessing it. You launch things on demand because the startup time is fine and that way you can support a lot more users than uh, would otherwise be the case. When the music service starts up, the onCreate hook method is called and that can do any initialization that we might want to do and sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. Uh, then when an intent is actually sent, the the, uh, or sorry, once the intent is delivered, then the on start command initiates the playing of the song. So that's, that's how we actually get the thing delivered, the intent delivered to the application. On create just is, an, is a constructor, if you will. On start command is where the actual intent shows up that we can, we can use. And then we can also stop things. So as you saw before, when I click the, play, the, the stop button, that ended up calling stop service and stop service would then destroy the music service, which would shut it down, and it would stop playing music. And then if you wanted to relaunch it again, you'd go through the whole process, basically, uh, uh, from the start. You'd reactivate it. All right. So let's take a little bit closer look at the source code here. Take a look inside. We're going to see that there's a, a music activity and a music service. So those are the two things we're going to look at. And if you go here to the CS251 GitHub account and you look under the examples directory, you'll find music playing service. So you're welcome to take a look at the code. It's, um, it's really pretty concise and it's very cool and you can play Eruption, right? So what's not to like?
So we'll see that there's a bunch of different methods. I'm going to talk through them very quickly, and I'll go and look at the source code in more detail to kind of show you what it looks like. So the hook method that we're going to have um, on the music activity side of the house is on create. That's, of course, called when the activity is first launched, and it does the typical things. These always happen more or less the same way. Call up to the super class, set the content view, and then cache any widgets or buttons you might need to to access and interact with the user. When the user clicks the play button, of course, that calls back to play song. And we'll see what it does. It starts playing a song by creating the right intent and then starting the service. We'll look at that in a second. Stop song basically goes ahead and calls stop service and uh, shut things down. Or if there's no song playing, it'll, it'll pop up a toast just to tell you that it's not doing anything. Um, the key music service methods, the methods that are defined by the music service include make intent. Now, this is essentially a factory method, and I stuck it over in the service because I figured the service ought to be the one that knows how to create the resources it needs in order to get itself started. But it doesn't have to be done that way. That's just one way to do it. And you'll see in a variety of different cases, I have different methods of having factories to start stuff up. And we'll talk more about this in a second. You can see here it makes a new intent with the action play. Uh, action and then the song URL that we want to use to play the song. On create is called when the service is created, and we're going to see it's going to make a, a new media player. We'll talk about that and set up some, some variables. On start command is the hook method called every time the music service is started. So on create is only called the first time the service starts up if it, if it isn't running. And then after that point, as long as it's running, then art st uh, the on start command gets called and um, on create won't be called again unless the server shuts itself down. So this is actually an example of a started service that can handle multiple operations because it keeps running until you explicitly stop it. It doesn't stop itself after the first, the first call. That's a little bit unusual in some cases. Uh, now, we're also going to talk about some other really cool stuff. And, and we'll go into this more detail when I look at the code in the editor. But basically, what you're able to do is you're able to use an advanced feature of Android's media player that allows you to do a lot of the initialization and preparation of the media player off the main thread of control, which is important when you're having it play from something that's downloaded from a URL, because it may take a while to buffer enough to start doing the play out. And you don't want that to sit on the main thread of control while the system cranks out application not responding dialogues. So you'll get a better idea when we look at the code of how that works. It's, it's pretty neat. It also allows you to be able to do concurrency without writing any threading in your code. And then the on destroy method is used to shut things down. <coughs> and stop song stops the media player from playing the song. So we'll look at that code in more detail in a second. Here's the manifest file for this. Notice how we have a music activity, which is mapped to this class in the package. And we have a music service, which is mapped to this class in the, uh, in the package. And this guy basically handles intents that are launch, launching the activity. and this service is used to handle play requests. So if you want to play something, the action play will get handled by this if you give it HTTP data plus various other kinds of things. All right, as, as you'll see in a second when we look at the code, this is a, a pretty simple example of a service. Your solutions are going to have to be a bit more sophisticated. And that's because unlike the Android Media Player, which comes pre pre-configured or pre-implemented to run things asynchronously off the main thread. Obviously, your download service doesn't come pre-configured because that's what you're doing for the assignment. And so as a result, there's some simplifications we'll see here that you don't see when you implement this stuff yourself. But basically, it's going to use the, the media player asynchrony service features to do that stuff in the background. And so in your case, the the download service that you write would actually do those things in the background. Um, in this case, we don't have to do that because of the way it's defined. There's also the other thing that makes this a little bit simpler than what your solution is. This is a good example of a service that doesn't actually communicate back to the activity that started it. So all that's going to happen here is you as a, a, an application client, the activity, the, the music activity, are going to start the service passing it the link you want it to play. And then that service will, will start up and run in the background. And it will not deliver anything back to the client. It'll just play on the 
on the audio device on the phone. So that's a little different from what you're doing, because in your solution for assignment four, you actually have to pass back the path name. Yes, Jonathan. For the music surface, if you were to uh, press play for one URL and then give it another URL and press play again without stopping it, does it automatically do it itself? Uh, no. You, it, you I, to... You'll see when we look at the implementation, we, we programmatically detect a case where we get another intent while a song is playing, and we stop the current song and start the new one. Yeah, that's a good question. OK, so that's basically. Well, <laughs> it's funny. <clears throat> For some reason, I think I told you this before, the program decides it just likes to quit every once in a while. And it always is about 40 minutes into class. It's pretty funny. Um, this is actually a good, good time, though, to, to switch over. And I will show you the solution. So let's pick up here. So here's the music playing service. Hopefully. It may be a little hard to see in the back, but you can watch the video to see what we're seeing. This is just the intent, the uh, Android manifest file that defines the intent filters. We looked at those things before. No real difference there. Let's now go ahead and look over here. So here's music activity. That does seem a little bit small. Let me see if I can make that a little bigger. For some reason, the choice is between 24 point and 36 point. That's the only choice you get. So 36 points pretty huge, but you should be able to see it in the back now. All right. So here's music activity. It is an activity. As usual, we keep a little tag we can use for debugging. Yeah. What is, it, what is the wake clock permission? What is the which permission? A wake clock permission. Oh, a wake lock. Um, where, where did you see that? It was, on the was that the manifest file? Oops. I think I'll, I'll tell you as soon as I look, but I'm pretty sure. So basically what you can do in, in Android is you can have things continue to show up even if you don't touch the screen for a long period of time. Um, by default, after a certain amount of time, the system says, you haven't touched the screen. I'm going to you know, power off and go into lock screen mode or something like that. Certain kinds of content, like watching a video, <laughs> you don't want it to time out after 30 seconds and then go blank. Right? That defeats the whole point of having a, a video player play out a, an MP4 file. So in Android, you have these things called wake locks. And wake locks are part of the Android power management mechanisms. And so what you can do is if you want an application to remain active, even if nobody has touched it for a while or interacted with it, you can grab a wake lock. And the wake lock prevents the thing from being you know, uh, powered down for the purposes of power management as long as you hold that. But obviously, grabbing a wake lock will um, consume resources, right? Because it's, it's like leaving your phone on all the time, right? Without letting it dim itself, it'll eat up battery power quite radically. So you typically have to give the, the application has to request permission to use a wake lock. And so this is simply saying this thing needs to be able to have a wake lock. Now, I don't think we actually use it in our implementation. But if we were to do it, we'd have to make the permission in there. Yeah? Isn't it just an MP3 for like a music player? So like I can sleep my phone, but the music still plays in the background. Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how it'll work if the phone sleeps. I mean, certainly you can let the screen go blank, and it'll still keep playing. But I, I think if you were to like, Hibernate, do the equivalent of hibernating your phone, it would probably stop. But yeah, that, that's what the stuff is for. It's basically to allow the application to keep doing something, even if it's not having input with the user for a certain amount of time. All right, so here's the default song. It's the Brain Candy song, which is somewhat mindless. This is where you get the user to enter your input, the URL that they want. We give it a default. If you don't give anything else, we give this default. And then we're going to have this thing called the music service intent. And you're going to see we're going to keep this cached to make it faster to go ahead and stop the service when we don't want it to run anymore. And uh, here's the onCreate method. That does what they always do. Nothing interesting there. All right, here's the play song method. So let's talk a little bit about play song. So play song is the hook method that gets called back. Or yeah, I guess it's a hook method. It's a hook method that gets called back when the user presses play.
So this is the one that's, that's associated with the onClick attribute in the, uh, the uh, resource layout file, the main.xml file. So we need it to get an intent to start up the service. Well, how do we do that? So to avoid making the activity know the details of how to start an intent, instead we use the gang of four factory method pattern and we have a factory method we define on the service called make intent. So let's go over and look at the music service. So here's music service. So you can see music service extends service and it implements the media player on prepared listener interface. And we'll see how that plays out in just a minute. Here is the make intent method. So when we call make intent over here, we pass in the context, which is the activity and which we don't really use, so we could probably get rid of it. And we pass in the URL for whatever the user gave, either what they entered or the default. And that's hidden in this little method, this helper method called get URL string. And so that gets passed here. And you can see we just go ahead and make a new intent with the action play action. And we turn that string, which is the URL to the song, into something called a URI, which is just a special encoded object that knows how to have access to web resources uh, or local resources for that matter. And then we make a new intent with that as the action and the song URL as the data. So those are the two things. And that gets sent back. Now here's an interesting question for you. Remember I told you that the, the service ran in a separate address space, right? Because of the fact that we set the process attribute in the manifest file. When you call make intent, in what address space is the implementation of make intent going to live? The activity, the activity exactly. Which is kind of weird, but that's just the way it works. So even though the service logic will run in a separate address space, the activity is still linked to it and can make method calls on it. And this is a good example of how it does that. That's a little bit weird at first, but it comes in handy for these kinds of factory method oriented designs. Yes, sir? No, actually it doesn't. It, the make intent is in the same address space. The other stuff we're about to see is, is in another address space. The main intent, the make intent method is in the same address space as the activity implementation. But when we actually do start service and send over the intent, that gets handled in a separate process. And that's somewhat confusing. Yes? Why is, um, uh, why is the music service intent uh, a global Uh, why is it, oh, you mean up, up there? Uh, you'll see. The reason for doing it like that is so that we can reuse the same intent to stop the service without having to make it a, another intent. We didn't have to do that. It was just an optimization. It also lets you know if you've already started it. Yeah, when? Why does make, uh, where make intent live matter? Why does make intent where make intent live matter? Um, it doesn't really matter. I'm just explaining where it lived, but it doesn't really matter. It, it could live in the server, but it, it doesn't. And well, actually, it couldn't, <laughs> but um, if it lived in the server, we'd have to do more things to it in order to be able to make it talk back and forth. Okay, so once we've got the intent, we then call start service and we pass the intent in. And when start service gets called, then the first time it gets called, the onCreate hook method will get called back. And as you can see, what onCreate does, this only gets called one time. So, well, it get, gets called one time per life cycle of a given instance of the music service. So you can see what I mean by that when I get a little further into the example. So you can see up here, onCreate gets called. This calls up to its super classes on create, And then we go ahead and we make a new media player and we stash that away. And then we tell the media player, we're going to be handling streaming music. And there's a couple of different flags you can give it depending on what kind of music you're going to be playing. But in this case, we're, we're going to be giving it streaming music because we're giving it a URL to download. And it'll probably stream it. It'll download a portion of it and not try to cache the whole thing locally. All right, called one time. So you can think of onCreate as something like a constructor, if you will, for the service. Now, after calling start service with this intent, onCreate gets called the first time. And then every other time that start service gets called, after the intent is, after the service is created the first time, the onStart command method gets called back. So th this again takes, it's a little bit, get, takes a little while to wrap your head around this, but think about onCreate of a service is like a constructor. It gets called one time per instance of this thing. 
And then as people call start service henceforth, then those calls just go directly over without going through on create. And they go to on start command. So this is kind of a first time in initialization hook. On create is a first time in initialization hook. So on start command gets called. It's get past the intent and some other stuff. We're not going to worry about the other stuff right now. When we get a little further into this, you have to worry about the other stuff. So this goes back to Jonathan's question. If the song was already playing, right? If, if we've got a song playing, stop the song, right? So we had to program the, into that. <coughs> Otherwise, in, in either case, either the song wasn't playing or it was playing and we've stopped it. Oh, and let's go look at stop song. So stop song is pretty easy. <coughs> stop song simply says, hey, player, stop playing the song. Reset yourself and note that nobody's playing at the moment. So when you run Android, let's see, I might have this up here. Um, Logcat. Uh, well, you can, there's not a whole lot of stuff in there right now. But um, when you're running, let's say you're using Eclipse, obviously Android Studio does the same thing. Whenever you do a log operation, that gets vectored to Logcat, and you can go see the operations that have taken place. Really useful to learn how to, do, actually, it's really the only way easy way to debug your Android program short of learning how the debugger works, which you can do, but it, it's more complicated. So logcat is typically the first thing you do when your program doesn't work. You put these log statements in your code, and then you go look at the output, and you see what is going on. Did I get to this point? What happened? And you can log things with error logging, debug logging, information logging, warning logging, etc. And then you can filter on those different categories to determine the severity in which you want the log information portrayed to you. Other questions about that? All right. So this is a little mysterious thing. So the music player in Android, if you ever need to do anything with it, very, very complicated piece of code written largely in C and C++. Gigantic amount of things going on there. And it's got a, basically a giant state machine that keeps track of what state it's in to determine what the operations do when you call them. And if you call things in the wrong order, you get these really weird messages back, like Android Media State 600, or you're like, what the heck is that? And the first thing you do is like Google that on uh, Stack Overflow, and it'll tell you, oh, you forgot to call the reset button, or whatever, right? So you have to make sure you do things in the right order. And luckily, Stack Overflow has the bulk of that stuff explained. So that's how we stop a song. Once the song is stopped, or if there never was a song playing in the first place, we then come in here and we say, hey, media player. Here's the data source I want you to play out, please. So you use the set data source method and you give it the URL. And so what we then do is we say to the media player, you know, so here's the, here's the URL I want you to download from, I want you to stream from. Um, and then we say, and call me back when you've got something to play. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. And then the last thing we do before we bail out of this on start command method is we say, hey, media player, prepare to play the song asynchronously. Now, there's obviously two different modes. One is prepare sync, or one is prepare, which is the synchronous version. And then there's the prepare async, which is the asynchronous version. The synchronous version of this whole thing will just block waiting for the song to be downloaded, or once you call play, it'll, it'll basically uh, download enough of it to get something that can be played out, but it'll block the thread of control. And it turns out you don't want to do that in the main thread. Oddly enough, unless you set some other magic flags, uh, you even don't want to do that if your, your service is running in a background process. It, it still can cause Android some headaches uh, if you do it in the main thread. So the way to get around this is either to set a flag that says, let it run in the main thread, because darn it, it's in a background process, which is possible, but not recommended, or you use prepare async, which does some cool magic, which we can look at at some point because it's interesting. It's, it's all mostly written in C and C++ code. It starts the preparation in a background thread, and when that background thread is done, it then is going to call back to a hook method. And that hook method, which we'll talk about in a second, is called on prepared. But I don't, I don't want to talk about that quite yet. What we'll start talking about when we get next time, we might have a little time to start this today, but we probably won't get to the whole thing. Um, when on start command is done, it returns some information 
and that information is used by the Android service framework, which is the runtime infrastructure Android uses to dispatch services, which is implemented by the Activity Manager service, in order to inform it what to do if something goes wrong while this service is running. And this basically says, start not sticky. And you'll see there's three typical responses you give back. And this one says, if this service shuts down, don't restart it. Wait till the next application goes ahead and calls uh, start service before you redo things. Some services you want to have relaunch themselves. Other services just evaporate and they wait till someone re restarts them through some other means. This happens to be that form. Jonathan. Does the reset cancel out the prepare vSync? The reset? Um, I don't know whether it cancels. I think it just resets the state machine to the beginning. So it says you've got to go through all these steps over again. Oh, well, so, so what's happening, keep in mind what happened here. So we gave, it the, we gave it the link, right? We said, um, set data source. So here's the URL I want you to do. We said, I'm the guy to call back when you've downloaded enough of this thing to start playing it. And then we say, start downloading it in the background, right? That's what that's saying at that point. And then we give up control. When enough of this thing has gotten called back that we can start to play the song, then the Android media player framework will call back to the on prepared hook method here, which gives us a chance to finish the state machine. So now that we've got enough to play, we can then say, I just want to hear this song once, thank you. That's what looping means. We, we set our, our own flag saying we're now playing, and then we say music player start playing the song. So at that point, you know, there will be a, probably be a buffer of, of song that's long enough to start the play out, and it'll start to play. And, and of course, the whatever is downloading the file will continue to run concurrently with whatever is happening with the play out. So any questions about that? Yeah, when? Is prepare like a middle ground uh, between <coughs> eager uh, and later? I'm sorry, what, what was the question? Is, is prepare like a middle ground between eager and lazy? Oh, got it, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good question. So, um, so what's happening with prepare async is it's just saying, you know, do it in the background. So it's, it's actually sort of somewhat orthogonal. Um, you've got to download the file, right? Or you've got to download enough to play out. So two ways to do it, um, or many ways to do it. One way to do it is just block at that point, waiting for it to download, which would take forever. Uh, you know, it would be a perceptible gap. Another way to do it is to start it up and then start playing it once you get enough to download and then let the rest of it stream out. I mean, I'm sure you guys all have had the experience with YouTube where you're on YouTube and you are playing a song, you know, and it's got the red part and it's got the gray part. And if you've got a slow network, the red part catches up with the gray part and then it says, you know, error or not error, but it's like buffering or whatever it says. Um, and so you've got to wait till it inches down a little bit and they catch up. So that's what it's basically doing. That's why those things are separated. So you can start the you can start to play it after you've downloaded enough to make progress. So prepare async is just saying, do that in the background. You don't have to worry about it. If you didn't have prepare async and on prepared, like you don't in your assignment for, how would you handle this? What would you do? Uh, if you were doing an activity, that's what you would do. But if you're doing a service, what would you do? So it turns out that's actually your assignment, right? So what you do is you <laughs> get win. Um, I mean, the service can block asynchronous, uh, synchronously as it, like, your, your activity will still be responsive, but maybe it'll do nothing. Okay. So what you can do, and, and what you guys will do is you go, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Do you define your own service interface? Uh, no, it's actually much simpler than that, luckily. Uh, and when you, look at the, when you look at the videos, or when we get to that part, probably either next class or when we get back from spring break, you'll see that you end up spawning a thread and then you do that stuff off the main thread. And when it's done, you either you know, run it in the background or you send back something to the main thread of the, the service and have it do it there. So basically, you would implement in Java what the media player is doing for you in C and C++. You would explicitly implement that code, which, you, which you'll do, because that's exactly what you have to do to download the file. 
because you don't want to download the file on the main thread of control. You want to download the file in a background thread and then get the result back so it can be sent. Yeah. Isn't the service already in a background thread? Ah, good question. Yeah, so, so the question is, is the service in a background thread? No. Um, the service by default runs in the same UI thread that the activity runs in. And this particular overview doesn't emphasize that a lot, but we'll see that in much more detail. Now, in this particular case, the service runs in a background process. So that is, you know, yes, that is in a different thread than the UI thread of the activity because it's in a different process. So by, by virtue of the fact that it's a different process, it's certainly a different thread. But as I said before, for some odd reason, Android doesn't detect that automatically. And so if you don't fiddle around with some policy settings to get to allow the main thread of the server process to do network operations, it will give you a weird warning and or an error. Services are not spawned in a different thread by default. That's absolutely right. So if you want them to run a different thread, you can either make them an intent service, which is what the undergrads are doing for assignment number, for assignment number uh, four, or you could spawn your own thread by other means, which is what the grad students will do. Do, do intent services spawn in a new thread by default? Uh, we'll look in detail about the intent service. And in fact, if you watch the video, you can find out earlier what it does. But basically what it does is it spawns a background thread and then when the request comes in, the intent service grabs the intent, makes a message, sticks it on a queue of other intents that have come in, and then the other thread of control pulls those things off the queue one at a time and calls their on-handle intent hook method. And so each request is processed one at a time in a background thread with the intent service. And we'll talk more about that when we get to that. Oh, the media, pl nah, good question. The media player is not an intent service. The media player is, is the media player. Let's take a look, um, and I will give you a better explanation from that cryptic comment. So, Android media player. I think, yeah, so, there we go. So here's the media player. And you can, you can see why I said this was a somewhat convoluted thing. This is the state machine that the media player goes through, right? So um, you know, we're talking about reset, set data source, prepare async, prepared, um, on prepared, listener on prepared. <laughs> so you can see there's all kinds of crazy things going on here. And this documentation goes into a great degree of detail explaining how it all works. You know something complicated when it takes like 25 screens to even get to the part where they talk about the first method in the class, right? So it's, it's a non-trivial thing. Um, so the media player is implemented as a system service. So it's not an intent service. It's not a, it's not a user level service. It's a system service. And I think it's called Stage Fright. I think that's the one that they come bundled with. If you really want to amuse yourself, the source code's all available. And you can go look at it. And it's very, very, very complicated. But it's also very powerful and efficient, too. The good news for you is you don't have to know or care anything about that. You just have to know how to access it via the state machine methods it exposes via the media player API. Yes, Tristan. Are these lower level services, like not, not applications that you know, some Android developer would make, but the, the services that Google provides for their phones, mm -hmm. do those use those same, they use the same, you know, the frameworks that we're learning about here with Google? Ah, great question. And, and uh, services and activities. And yeah, so the question basically is what is the programming model for an Android system service, like the music service, music playing service, versus the, the uh, services that we're doing. It's similar, uh, although it's all written in C and C++, so it's lower level, but it's got much the same structure and much the same patterns. It's just typically got access to lower level resources that you might not either might not expose to the application developer or you choose to hide the complexity behind a facade that's simpler. And it, you'll see this over and over again with Android. Even with the, the services in Android that are written in Java, there oftentimes will be an API facade that's very simple or, or simpler. And then there's a service that's running in the background, which could be in C++ or Java, doesn't matter. Um, and it's much, much more complicated. But the exposure you have to it is, is much lighter weight and easier. So as an example, um, start activity, start service, send broadcast, right? These are all API calls you make on something called the context. And those are very simple facades that interact 
with the Activity Manager service, which is a system service written in Java, but it's like 20,000 lines long and it's got awful complicated. But it still has you know, the basic structure of the stuff we're talking about here. It's just it's got a lot more things to it as well. Okay, so let me finish up the analysis of this code. So as you can see, when onPrepared gets called, now we are actually in playing mode. Things start to play in the background. And we can go and do whatever we want from a, you know, moving around with the, the user interface to a different application perspective. And then at some point, if we navigate back to that screen that was on the task uh, back stack somewhere and click the stop button, the stop song will get called. And you can see it. this is the answer to the earlier question, why do we have this global intent? Or it's not really global, but it's, it's a data member or a field in the class, uh, the activity class. If this guy is not null, that means the song was started, right? We started the song. And so we go ahead and tell the music service, hey, stop playing this, please. And we make this guy null. And if you click this thing when no song is playing, we show a toast. So if you want to figure out how to do a toast, which could be helpful for assignment number three, revisions, here's how you do a toast. So why do they call it a toast? It pops up, right? So it, it's, it's the thing that pops up for a short duration. You can either make it a short duration or a long duration just by changing the flag. A short duration pops up probably for like a second or two at the most. The long duration one will go a little bit longer. And you give it the context, which in this case is just the activity. You give it what you want it to say. And then you say toast.makeText. And it goes ahead and pops that little thing up. And you'll, if you have an Android phone, you see toast all the time. Like when you lose your network signal, it'll pop up and say network unreachable. When you find your network signal again, it comes back and says connected to you know, VUM, MMIV, or whatever it is. Um, so that's what a toast does. That's just a hel helper method to make it a little bit easier to call. And then here's the get URL string, which sees that the user gave any input. And if not, it makes the URL to be the default song. All right. So that's basically it. Yeah, Jonathan. Does a toast have like the OK button? Or is that just something? Ah, that good question. So yeah, that's a, a toast does not interact with the user other than to display. If you wanted to get an OK, that would be a dialog. And, and you know, there, are, there are dialogues galore, um, or a certain kind of dialogue, but interacting dialogue. And so that's a different widget that you get with the Android user interface toolkit. OK, any questions about, about that? So um, to reiterate, your assignment four is more complicated because you not only have to, to explicitly do things concurrently, number one, like download a file, but you also have to communicate back to the activity, the download activity that uh, initiated this thing in the first place. And that'll take a bit more doing. So the way to, to manage that complexity, let's see if we can go bring this thing up here. Um, what's the fastest way to do that? Let's go here. All right, we will go to Van D, CS251, CS251, assignments, assignment four, they're really the same thing. And this gives a very cursory overview because everything's buried in the to-do list inside the code. So this is just giving you an overview. Um, this kind of explains basically what you're doing. You're re-implementing re assignment three using a service this time, not a download act, uh, an activity. And the undergrad students can use intent service. And if you want to learn about intent service, there's a video that is right here that talks about it. And the grad students, or those of you who are taking the class for grad credit, have to use the bound, a bound service. And there's an overview of bound service in this video. And, and actually, everybody has to use the messenger. So uh, I'll probably go back and revise this description a little bit. But the point is that um, you have to use the messenger for both cases. So learn about the messenger class and watch this video, service to activity communication via Android Messenger. And then people doing the bound service want to watch these videos. And we'll cover that stuff in class. But if you want to get a head start, that's what you can do. Yeah. 
a, a bound versus started. So you would typically use bound services if you're going to have a, an extended conversation with something. This particular example, honestly, bound service is a little overkill. And I mostly did it because we had to make the grads do something different than the undergrads, and this was interesting. Um, and I think you'll, industrial strength services oftentimes are used as bound services because they're doing more than just one thing or one, one shot operation. The started services are simpler to write, but if you're engaging in long running conversations, they're more complicated. You can do it, but it just is more complicated. And we, we sort of do it with um, the assignment, but it takes more work. And so when we start talking about the Android interface definition language, you'll see that, um, which we're not doing for this assignment, but we'll talk about later, that really relates to bound services. And then you can just make method calls that just go back and forth, and they're really cool. Kevin. Uh-huh. No, the Android detects that and we'll we'll make sure it gets notified. Ah, great question. So the intent service by default has a background thread. So whether or not the service is configured to run in a separate process or the same process as the, the activity. It's OK to do blocking calls in the on handle intent hook method that's called back because that's always going to be in a separate thread from the UI thread. We're going to, if you watch the intent service video, uh, yeah, if you watch the video on intent service, I actually walk through the implementation and we'll, we'll cover that later in this class. And you can see exactly what it's doing. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's actually implementing a very common idiom that's used other places in Android. And uh, it basically spawns a thread that manages a message queue and then does the dispatching from that background thread. 